So let's remind ourselves where we were in the last class. So what we found was the following action. Uh, if I write something, if I get si something wrong, especially signs wrong, somebody, please, please correct me. Um, OK. Uh, we had minus um, x mu. OK, let's first write it as sophisticatedly as we can, and then we'll write it in cruder ways. So uh, I think we had a minus here. Then we had del alpha x mu, del alpha x mu. Um, del alpha x mu, del alpha x mu, where this alpha was now just in the metric ds squared was equal to minus d tau squared plus d sigma squared. It's a flat space metric on the well sheet of the string. <coughs> okay. X mu was the metric in flat space and space time. So there's a second metric which is ds squared is equal to minus d t squared plus d x i squared. Okay. And hopefully I've got the signs um, uh, I'll find right. Let's check. Suppose I do the, I look at the uh, thing for the xi's. This is minus kinetic, no, no. For the, yeah, for the xi's, it's minus kinetic plus this other sign is right. And I get xi, the xi term here comes with xi dot squared yeah. minus xi prime squared. Okay. Great. We also, at the end of the last lecture, defined two light like coordinates. So we had, I can't remember, did we call it sigma plus and sigma minus? Equals tau plus sigma by square root 2. Tau plus minus sigma by square root 2. And we had x plus and x minus, which was t plus x, d minus 1, plus minus d minus 1 by square root 2. Okay. Great. Now, do you remember that our, the, the full answer for the last, at the end of the last class? was to solve this action, but then we hadn't finished our job. There were two things left to do. The first thing was to impose the constraint equations. Del plus x mu, del plus x mu, is equal to del minus x mu, del minus x mu, is equal to 0. Can somebody remind me where that came from? For what? Equation of motion. Both of you are right. Equation of motion for what? For uh, x. Not for x. Equation of motion for x is a linear function of x. G alpha beta. You remember we gauge fixed the metric on the world sheet of the string to be I identity. You can do that gauge fixing, but in that process you lose the equation with respect to the world sheet metric. Th there were three equations with respect to the world sheet metric. One of those equations turned out to be trivial, an identity. Can you anyone remind me why that equation turned out? These were the two non-trivial equations. This was the equation from g plus plus, so a plus plus upper. This was the equation from g minus minus upper. And the equation from g plus minus turned out to be a triviality. Somebody remind me why that was the case. Exactly. That the, the original action, square root g, g alpha beta, del alpha x mu, del beta x mu, was while invariant. And the g goes to e to the power phi times g, this action was invariant. So if we vary the action with respect to the while factor, that just gives us 0 is equal to 0. And that variation with respect to the while factor uh, about the flat space background is the same as the equation of motion in varying in the plus minus direction. Because in flat space, the only component of the metric was plus minus. So while factor changes only the plus minus. Is this clear? So there this equation remained to be imposed. Plus, we'd still not finished. We had the equation that if we had x mu of um, of sigma plus and sigma minus, then that should be identified with x mu of f of sigma plus g of sigma plus. Can somebody remind me where that came from? Diffeomorphism, but why, why this particular form? Exactly. Both of you are right. So you remember that uh, uh, while plus diffeomorphisms 
was a gauge invariance of our HD of the Polyakov action. And therefore, any diffeomorphism under which the metric transforms only by a, by a while factor. Sorry, Polyakov action is the action written without the square root. This, uh, it's the, the Polyakov action is this one, square root g, g alpha beta. This is the Polyakov action. One mean by four pi. Okay, it's this action that we gauge fixed to get this. The action with the square root is called the Nambu go to action. Okay, so um, you remember that in this action, we we this action was equivalent to Nambu Goto provided we treated both while and diffeomorphisms as gauge invariants. Now, any diffeomorphism that can be uh, whose change of the flat space may then be fixed gauge, the fixed while plus diffeomorphism by demanding that the metric of the world sheet be this character. <coughs> And then that that sounds good, except that if you have a while plus diffeomorphism that does not change that metric, that for that those th those diffeomorphisms have not yet been fixed by a choice of gauge. Okay, w what are these while plus diffeomorphisms that do not change the metric? The while plus diffeomorphisms under which the metric remains unchanged, flat space remains unchanged. Now under diffeomorphisms we know how a metric changes. So it must be that if it remains unchanged in a diffeomorphism plus while, the while factor is chosen to compensate that change of the metric under diffeomorphism. But when can that be done? That can only be done if the metric remains only in the plus minus direction. Because the flat space metric here was only in the plus minus direction. Okay, let's write that. Uh, this is equal to two d sigma plus d sigma minus. Maybe with a minus sign. Minus. Okay, so it can only possibly happen if the metric after the diffeomorphism, diffeomorphism remains only purely in the plus minus direction. And if it pure does remain purely in the uh, plus minus directions, clearly you can by while rescaling take it back to one because whatever that factor appears there, you re redefine that in the while rescaling. Okay, so we then discussed in the last class that there were obvious diffeomorphisms, namely x plus goes to a function of x plus and x minus goes to a function of x minus that do the job. They change the metric only up to uh, they change the metric only up to this while scale. Okay, so uh, any such diffeomorphism plus its compensating while factor, but we do uh, since under under while factors x's don't transform. We don't even see that. Okay, any such diffeomorphism is an unfixed gauge invariance of our system, and therefore we've not completely fixed a gauge. We've come to this form. Largely fixing our gauge freedom, but not completely. Why do I say that this is a small fraction of the diffu of the gauge invariance that we had uh, initially? Why do we say we I've almost we've almost completely fixed gauge? Because we are uh, excluding the fact that a of sigma plus and sigma minus can be exactly. Yeah. These are diff these are diffeomorphisms of only one variable rather than two. This is an infinitesimal fraction of the number of diffeomorphisms of two variables. So we've almost completely fixed gauge, but not quite. So what, uh, what is our job? Our job is to solve the equations that come from this problem, to finish solving the problem classically. Let me move on to quantum mechanics. Solve the equations that come from this problem, impose this constraint, and also to regard solutions, you know, to, uh, uh, to treat solutions that are uh, equivalent under such a diffeomorphism as, I, as identical. Okay, so deal only with equivalent classes under this equivalence. So let us as first, uh, as the first shot, okay? Let us as the first shot just take one of the x's out of x views and solve the equations of motion that come from the first action, okay? So I'll choose, choose one of the x's since they all ob obey exactly the same classical equations coming from bearing this angle. Doesn't matter which, so I'll just call that x. What I say will be true for every x, okay? So the equations here <coughs> are del plus, del minus, equations of motion that come from bearing this action, x mu is equal to zero. Is this clear to everyone? 
There are zillions of ways of seeing this. One way is to write this out in plus minus coordinates. You will see that the action is proportional to del plus del, del minus, which is basically the statement that both g and its inverse have only plus minus components. So if we wrote it out explicitly using the metric, this would be del alpha, del beta, g alpha beta upstairs. G alpha beta has only plus minus components. So one of, the, one of them is a plus, the other is a minus. Some factors of two, but for the equation of motion, they go away. So we don't care. <laughs> okay. Now I've deliberately written the equation of motion in this language, in the language of plus and minus, because the solutions to the equation of motion then become totally obvious. So who can tell me the most general solutions to these equations? Uh, the convenient solution of uh, plus and plus minus. minus. Exactly, a function of x plus, plus and another function of x minus. You know, I remember when, when I was in 11 standard, uh, reading about the wave equation in Resnick and Halliday, and finding it incredible. Wow, how, what a wonderful solution. Any function of x plus, any function of x minus, the same thing. Same equation, same solution. Okay. Okay, great. Now, so we've got x mu is some arbitrary function. Let's call it, uh, okay. let's just call it x. So it's some f of sigma plus, I mean, I won't call it the same as this f, f of sigma plus plus g of sigma minus. This is the most general solution of these equations. We we'll solve the equation by integration, right? Okay, so that's really cool. Now there's something very important here that I want that before we start looking at these equations, these solutions in more structural, more more detail, parameterizing these solutions in more detail, there is a structurally important fact here, and that is this. And of course, it's not a coincidence; it happens all the time when you don't completely fix the agent. And that is this. That is that although at the off-shell level, x's were functions, arbitrary functions of sigma plus and sigma minus. And so this remaining diffeomorphism invariance was a trivial fraction, negligible fraction of all off-shell conditions. On-shell, each of the dx mu's is a function of a sigma plus plus another say, a, a function of a sigma minus. So do you see that the unfixed gauge invariant has exactly as much, or almost exactly as much freedom in it as the on-shell content of one of the x's? Because any one of the x's is specified by specifying one function of sigma plus and one function of sigma minus. So you can fix for one coordinate. Exactly, exactly. On the shell. Okay, this is very important. Off shell, off shell, x is for functions of sigma plus and sigma minus, and this uh, gauge invariance here was completely infinitesimal, un unimportant. But on shell, it's as much as the amount of freedom in one of the x. Now, why is this important? Why is this important? At the moment, we're just in classical physics. All of classical physics is on shell. We're just parameterizing solutions to equations of motion. What we have seen here is that though, suppose we were in D dimensions, let's call it capital D. We were in capital D dimensions. Naively, the number of solutions to the uh, equations of motion that came from that action were two into capital D, two functions of one variable. Because the functions of sigma plus and the functions of sigma minus, of these two into capital D functions, all should not be treated as inequivalent classical configurations. Only two into capital D minus one of them correspond to inequivalent classical configurations. Because those solutions that are related by a diffeomorphism of this form, to any two solutions related by a diffeomorphism of this form, are supposed to be thought of as the same solution. That was part of the rules of the game. So if we're trying to parameterize inequivalent classical solutions, we should not count this as di these as distinct. Now, in our first round, which is what we're doing now, we will tackle this irritating unfixed diffeomorphism in the simplest way, simplest but you know crudest way. 
which is by gauge fixing. When possible, it's always nice to re deal with things in a gauge invariant. But that, that possibility, while elegant, often comes at the, at the cost of great the lack of simplicity. We will actually do that, do something like that in a gauge invariant way in the more sophisticated part of the course, starting next lecture. But in this first round, we will just be crude. So what will we do? Let us define, as we did in, oh, we did here. We've got x plus and x minus defined here. OK? So what we will do is almost completely fix x plus and x minus. OK. Now before that, there's one more thing I want to say. Before I show you exactly what fixing we're going to do, one more thing I want to say, say, which will help us understand the physical meaning of one of the terms that enter in our physics, which is this. So let's, let's forget about this equivalence for now. Let's go back just to solving the equation, equations of motion for one of these. Let's take one of these x's, so let's say an xi, OK? And parameterize solutions. So of course, we can write xi, you know, it's some arbitrary function of uh, sigma plus plus arbitrary function of sigma minus, OK? Uh, it's an arbitrary function of sigma plus plus arbitrary function of sigma minus. Now, any such function can be written as follows. This, I'm going to write it down, and then you'll see if you agree with me. xi is equal to um, p, let's say, a tau plus uh, okay, let me first write it. Write, write it as fun in this way. This is equal to a plus sigma plus plus sum over n alpha n by n. And I'm going to put an i here, maybe not. Okay, let's put the i later. Uh, let's 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 avoid the i for now. Uh, alpha n by n e to the power i n sigma plus. Uh, you want you say a minus here? Sorry, who, 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 who suggested the minus? You suggest the minus? Yeah, maybe I want a minus here. Uh, when we write the harmonic oscillator, when we put an a, is it with an e to the power minus i omega t? A goes with minus i omega t. So I want this also. The positives I would like to be like a's. So I'd like for them to go with minus. Good. So it's a minus. OK. So yeah, let's put a minus here. Exactly. Now this n is equal to all integers, not equal to 0. OK? So n is e n not equal to 0, but otherwise all integers. OK. That's the plus part. No, negative integers too. Right. And similarly, xi here is equal to a minus. So, so the zero part is separated out here. Hmm. Okay, and I'm sorry. I also want an x zero. Mm. Some constant. And here also I'll write some x zero. Let's say I'll write an x zero plus and x zero minus. And let's write this as alpha tilde n by n alpha minus n by n. Yeah, why, why not? No, no, let's, that'll get very confusing. Let's call this alpha and let's call this alpha tilde. n by n e to the power minus i n sigma minus. These are a and g. f and g, exactly. Sorry, f and g. Right. All I've done here is write down the most general Fourier transform of a function that is periodic with periodicity 2 pi. This part is totally clear. This, you remember sigma when was identified with sigma uh, plus 2 pi? But sigma plus was tau plus sigma. So sigma is identified with sigma plus 2 pi with tau held fixed. Then that means sigma plus is identified with sigma plus plus 2 pi. So whatever function we write down here has to be uh, uh, periodic in that way. 
okay uh, more precisely but come come let's keep this aside for one minute more precisely x has to be a periodic function okay now no lack of periodicity here can compensate for a lack of periodicity here because they have different dependencies on sigma plus and sigma minus so these things just have to be periodic by themselves and therefore they run over all integers okay now let's come to these zero mode things these zero mode things clearly also solve the equations of motion okay because they're functions of sigma plus and sigma minus but they appear like uh, upman you said not to be a periodicity condition however remember what has to be periodic is not the zero not fng themselves but x okay so if a plus and a minus were equal to each other then this would be something into sigma plus plus sigma minus but sigma plus plus sigma minus is tau and then it's okay then it would not be a function of sigma this kind of cancellation can't happen here because the non trivial dependence is on sigma plus but this guy didn't have a non trivial dependence so for this particular case if we just put some a here not a plus and a minus just a then it's okay okay now here you can put any constants you want but you know whether you call a constant part of sigma plus or sigma minus is a little stupid there's no physical meaning to how much of the constant you put in sigma plus uh, in in f and how much in g okay so we can just write it as some overall you know we can, so forgetting about this f plus g we can just write down the most general solution to x as x0 plus a times either sig let's say sigma plus plus sigma minus but that's a shorthand for writing tau with some constant plus sum over n alpha n by n e to the power minus i n sigma plus plus sum over n alpha minus uh, alpha tilde n by n e to the power minus i n sigma minus and now we good this is the most general solution this is the most general solution for any one of these x's okay this part of the solution is sometimes called the zero mode part of the solution no oscillators in it and you'll see that they will in many ways play a distinguished role the remaining part is the oscillator part of the solution and will play a sort of logically distinct role from these guys uh, as we will see it will by n i'm writing it for convenience for, for what happens later of course it's totally up to you you could write no uh, written o n uh, you know I'm writing it because in the end alpha n and alpha minus n will obey the standard commutation relations that we use in it. Okay. I I I'm sorry it has no no logical reason but it's a reason of convention. Oh, sorry. Okay. Great. Now the next thing I want to do is to give some meaning to this a okay now you see suppose i take this kind of expansion as suppose there were no zero modes involved yeah, do you see that when i plug when i look at uh, um if i plug this kind of expansion back into the action or back into any bilinear like the symplectic form the non zero modes will only talk with themselves because when we do the integral over sigma momentum n in the sigma direction can only click with momentum minus n in the sigma direction and the zero modes will only talk to talk to themselves okay so the zero mode part let's look at by itself as far as zero mode goes nothing depends on sigma because sigma plus plus sigma minus was just tau <coughs> okay so as far as the zero mode goes we can uh, this is the part of this action that would survive if nothing depended on sigma <coughs> is this clear but now what would happen to this action if nothing depended on sigma well let's look at this action if nothing depended on sigma if nothing depended on sigma the action would become minus 1 uh, s was equal to minus 1 by 2 alpha prime 
because I've done the integral over sigma, so 2 pi disappear. Okay, times uh, plus x dot squared. I've used the fact that our metric has a minus sign in dt. Okay. Now, in such an action, okay, uh, notice that this action here is exactly the action for a non relativistic particle of mass alpha prime. Oh, sorry, of mass 1 by alpha prime. Okay, it's exactly the action for a non relativistic <laughs> particle of mass uh, 1 by alpha prime. Now, what is the momentum conjugate to the position of such a particle? Well, it's p, t it's m times x dot. So, p, the momentum conjugate to the position, is equal to x dot divided by alpha prime. Okay. So if we do a canonical quantization, as we will do immediately, we should identify x dot here with alpha prime times p. Okay? So what I'm saying is that in this language, these two variables are canonically conjugate with each other. And the precise identification, the one that will give us Poisson bracket x, com, uh, x Poisson bracket p is equal to 1, is if we identify x dot, whatever appears as x dot, with alpha prime times p. Is this clear? Okay. Now this a here, uh, uh, in order to understand how that connects with x dot, I need to know what sigma plus plus sigma minus is in terms of uh, uh, do, uh, tau. But sigma plus plus sigma minus is clearly square root 2 tau. So do you see here, for the 0 mode part, x dot is equal to 2a square root 2. Because we've taken a times square root 2 tau and taken the derivative. Not a square root 2. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. And this is, yes. Yeah, that's capital X, but you see, it's just the zero mode part whose dot we take. We're just wor worrying about the zero mode at the moment. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Uh, in A prime G, we uh, get only the linear parts of uh, sigma plus or sigma minus. Uh, could there, in principle, be other parts, uh, 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 other functions of uh, sigma plus or sigma minus, which when summed, would uh, give some non trivial portion of tau apart from just uh, uh, this uh, linear. So this is just. No, uh, impossible if it's a f sum of a function of sigma plus and a function of sigma minus. Uh, suppose we took sigma plus squared plus sigma uh -huh. minus. Uh -huh. It will never work. Yeah. So only linear. Linear. only linear would work. OK. In fact, if you say it in terms of x, a more traditional way to do this mm -hmm. would be to do the, the traditional thing. Right? Take spatial configurations of x. Expand that in a Fourier series. Mm. You'll get a constant yeah. plus this kind of expansion. Yeah. Then plug that expansion back into the action. Mm. Each of these coefficients, we'll have to figure out the dependence on time. Mm. For the constant part, you'll find dependence on time is constant plus linear time. Right. For everything else, you'll find harmonic. Mm. So I've just done what, if you, if you proceeded in a slightly more mm. systematic, slightly more standard way, you would get the same answer without any guesswork. Okay? But it's clear from that point of view that you only had constant mm. plus, plus harmonic. Uh -huh. yes. okay? Time dependence from that point of view, you see the spatial dependence was constant plus harmonic. Yes. And time dependence came from the equation of motion. Mm. Is it clear? Yeah. So now, once you've got constant, mm. then it's a function of sigma plus and sigma minus, the only way it can be is. Okay, oh, you just solved the equation of motion mm -hmm. from this action. Yeah, is this, this, that's no ambiguity. I'm just cutting corners. Is this, this is the only solution. Is this clear? Okay, excellent. 
Okay. So let's keep going. Okay. So now, according to this, x dot was alpha prime times p. So alpha prime times p is equal to 2a. And therefore, our a is to be identified by alpha prime p by, sorry, square root 2, by square root 2. Okay? So this a here should be replaced by alpha prime p by square root 2. Hmm. It's just another name. At the classical level, there are two different names. But this name will guarantee that when we work out Poisson brackets, I'll have a good, good Poisson bracket. Is this clear? Fine. So with this diversion out of the way, now let us go back to our gauge fix. We wanted to fix this irritating gauge ambiguity by making a choice of gauge. Okay? And the choice of gauge we will make is we will set x plus uh, to be something nice. Now, what precisely was the freedom we had? Okay. What precisely was the freedom we had here? The freedom we had here was the freedom to do single valued diffeomorphisms. Okay? So the freedom we had here was the freedom to do single valued diffeomorphisms. Now these single valued diffeomorphisms allow us to uh, get rid of the periodic path of any x. They also, of course, allow us to shift co constant paths. Okay? But the moving part of an x, okay, the part of an x that, that is proportional to the tau, okay, will not be changed by single cannot be changed by single value diffeomorphism. Okay? So, so what I want to say, I mean the zero mode part cannot be changed because that's zero mode. Okay? Because that will not be single valued. Do you understand? Okay. So let's say it's more opposite. Suppose I take a sigma. Okay. Suppose I take a sigma and I do something like this. I do sigma plus is equal to sigma some f of sigma plus. This is the kind of coordinate change I'm making. Okay? And sigma minus is equal to g of sigma plus. Okay? These things have to be single valued uh, coordinate changes. Okay, so this guy, this sigma plus, which, which is f of sigma plus, can be, uh, you know, any, uh, okay, let's first do this. Let's first choose this. So what am I going to do? What I'm going to do is to take x plus and completely get rid of its oscillatory behavior. This I can do by one of the single value transformations. Is this clear? For instance, one way of doing that is to take del x plus and, oh, I suppose we can just do this. We can just define x plus uh, as the new sigma, yeah. So suppose I do this. Suppose I do x plus is some number times sigma plus. Okay, and x minus is equal to some the same number times sigma minus. Th 
Do you understand what I'm doing? What I'm doing is a new co a coordinate change. I originally had x plus was some arbitrary function of sigma plus. X, plus, x minus was an, so, uh, sorry, let me say this better. This was f and g, f plus and g plus. So this was the f function that appeared in x plus, and this was the g function that appeared in x plus. Since f was a function only of sigma plus, and g was a function only of sigma minus, if I make a coordinate, cho uh, coordinate change of this, this form, okay, if I make a coordinate change of the form, then our new x plus is what was f plus. Okay, and our new g plus was what was, our new sigma minus was what was g minus, uh, g, uh, g, yeah, sorry, g plus, g plus. Our new sigma minus was what was g plus, okay. That is a choice of the form sigma minus is a function of sigma minus. We'll come to that. Right now, at the moment they're different, we'll see if there's a constraint. Well, let's call this A, and let's call this B. Suppose I did this. This is clearly of the form sigma plus is a function of sigma plus, and sigma minus is a function of sigma minus. This is the a kind of coordinate change I can do. OK? However, I, I need my coordinate change. Whatever change I make of coordinates has to be single valued. OK? So what does this mean? It means that when I take um, sigma, which comes out of this, okay, which is um, uh, when I take sigma, which comes out of this, okay, this coordinate change should be it should go to itself under sigma goes to sigma plus two pi. Okay, so this is let's call this the new sigma. Here, this was function of old sigma. Let's call tilde the new sigma, which is being defined by this equation. Let's call it sigma plus and sigma minus the old sigma, which was there before. This is going to be my definition. Now let's calculate sigma tilde plus uh, Okay. So let's calculate sigma tilde plus minus sigma tilde minus. What? This is our new variable here. Do you understand? This is our definition of our new variable. So I'm calculating what sigma tilde plus minus sigma tilde minus is. Okay? So that is equal to 1 by A f plus of sigma plus minus 1 by b, f minus of sigma minus, g minus of sigma minus, g plus of sigma minus, sorry. Now I want to check whether as sigma, sigma goes to sigma plus 2 pi, whether sigma tilde also goes to sigma tilde plus 2 pi, whether this quantity here. We have to do to confirm that it's that it's working. Okay. Okay. So, let's see when that will work. Suppose I take sigma goes to sigma plus two pi. Okay. The periodic part just doesn't change. Okay. Um, the um, the. Uh, Yes, because that was tau plus sigma. Exactly. And we saw in the periodic part, right? Look at this periodic. Okay, good. So, uh, No, no, but we've decided to choose a coordinate on the string to make it periodic in 2 pi. That's part of our definition of, uh, of, the, uh, of the thing. 
So let's see, sorry. So now we have sigma plus going to sigma plus. Pl uh, okay, so what happens when I take the original sigma to sigma plus 2 pi? The periodic part just doesn't change. Uh, to do is to say that it's just this. Hmm. Uh, just, 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 uh, just one, sorry. Hmm. You see, wha wha I wanted more than what, what you were saying because I want that this thing increase by 2 pi as this increase by 2 pi. I want one winding around the original sigma to be one winding around the sigma. I want to see the jump as well. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, there is an increased jump, 2 pi times 1 pi minus 1 pi. Just, uh, I'm doing something stupid, just one. Mm. I'll tell you what I think will work. What I want to do, let me see, what do I want to do? I want to set x minus is equal to uh, x minus. I want to set x. Let's see. I, I, I'll tell you what I want eventually. I want to set x plus is equal to uh, alpha prime p tau. That's what I want to do. Uh, alpha prime p plus tau. Let me just. I want to show that I can use single valued coordinate changes to set x plus is equal to alpha plus alpha minus p plus tau. Mm. Mm. Okay, let me just do this carefully. Sorry. Just one point. Yeah. In the Fourier expansion, choosing the exponent, we, it is a minus root to it, yeah, yeah. plus is an uh, uh, give you the uh, definition of sigma plus minus. Oh, you're probably right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you're probably right. Uh, maybe we want to. So sigma is periodic on 2 pi. Sigma is periodic in pi, uh, 2 pi. Uh, now the standard definitions have this. Will it be? How, how will you? Let me get rid of this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what will change? Uh, sorry. 
sigma plus plus sigma minus is 2 tau, so by 2, right? Multiply by 2? Uh, well, sigma plus plus. No. Sigma plus plus sigma minus is now just tau, uh, is 2 tau. So this is, uh, uh, yeah, I think that's okay. It's we want an alpha prime p tau, right? So that 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 I think was okay. Uh, alpha prime p tau. This is also okay. Okay, no, nothing. I have some irritating square roots have gone. Sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me just do this part carefully. I'm sorry, sorry to waste your time. We had, let's say, x plus is equal to x0 plus plus alpha prime p by 2 uh, sigma plus plus sigma minus plus this um, oscillator part, right? O plus of sigma plus. Uh, plus, uh, plus O plus of sigma, F plus of sigma plus plus G plus of sigma minus. Let's say this is completely, this stuff has no winding. This stuff is totally single valued. Okay. This is all the purely oscillated, the non-zero non -zero frequency stuff. Okay. So what I want to do is now make a, make a, make a change of variables so that x plus, um, x plus simply becomes equal to x0 plus uh, plus alpha p by 2 sigma plus plus sigma plus. This is the change of variables I actually want to make. Okay. Uh, and this is now sigma tilde. I want to check that I can make such a change. Sorry, I, this is the change of variables I want to make. This, I want to check that we can make such a change. Okay? So suppose I can make such a change of variables. This guy is cancelling this guy. These two have to be equal to each other. Mm. So, yeah, I was doing things stupidly. Sorry. So alpha, pri, alpha p by 2 sigma plus sigma, this is this equation, right? That this is equal to alpha p by 2 sigma plus plus f plus Okay, and alpha p by 2 sigma tilde minus is equal to alpha p by 2 sigma minus plus g plus of sigma minus. Okay, now this I can clearly make. This change of variables I can clearly make because as sigma goes to sigma plus 2 pi, this part does not participate. Okay, so these sigma tilde and sigma behave, sigma plus behave exactly the same way. Under sigma goes plus to sigma plus 2 pi and sigma tilde goes to sigma tilde plus 2 pi. Okay, so clearly there is a change of variables, not respecting everything, that allows us to make this, this change of variables. This is what I wanted to say. Sorry for saying it in such a confused way. Is this clear? So what I'm going to do now is to adopt this variable, sigma tilde plus and sigma tilde minus. So the definition of sigma tilde plus and sigma tilde minus is that when I work with these new coordinates, which I will now I'll drop the tilde. X plus is equal to alpha prime P plus tau. Is that clear? Right, because basically what I've said is I've used the coordinate change to get rid of the oscillator part. So sigma X plus is purely zero mode. And I couldn't get rid of the zero mode part because that would ruin periodicity. That would ruin the periodicity. That's basically what I want to say. What? You, well, you could remove the constant part. We're not going to. We're not going to touch that. You see, there are some gate transformations that will actually be physical because that's like overall motion of the spring. Yeah. So yeah. No, actually, that's if not even. Goes to alpha prime no. Alpha prime no, I couldn't even have moved that. I couldn't even. A, a constant cannot be changed by changing. Sorry, mm -hmm. this constant. A constant cannot be changed by changing the coordinate. Yeah, it's just there. 
See, x is a function of something. What you're changing is what's inside there. Uh, you're right, you're right, you're right. X zero plus, thank you. Yeah. So the zero mark more part we can't touch because of periodicities. Okay? The remaining part we can get rid of by a coordinate choice and we do that. Basically just that. Okay, great. So this has made totally clear that our gauge freedom was enough to get rid of one coordinate. Because at least the oscillator part of one coordinate, because we just killed all the uh, everything oscillator like in x plus. Is this clear? Okay, so let's move on. So far what we've done is to get rid of this gauge freedom. But we still had to impose the constraint. The constraint was del minus of x mu, del minus x mu was equal to zero, and del plus x mu, del plus x mu was equal to zero. Okay, let's see what that constraint gives us. So we want del minus x mu, del minus x mu is equal to zero. Now let's see, x plus, in our gauge x plus, was equal to sigma plus plus sigma minus alpha prime p by 2. Right? Let's call this p plus. OK? So now, let's put this, plug this into this expression. Del minus of x plus is something utterly simple. It's simply alpha prime p plus by 2. So what we get is alpha prime p plus by 2 times del minus of x minus. Right? Where we are using that x mu, x mu is x plus x minus up to sines and minus uh, and uh, factors of 2. So let's get the sines and factors of 2 right. With this convention, x plus x minus is simply minus with no factor of 2 because it's like a square minus b square. Imagine this in the metric. Uh, yes? Yes? Is there del minus del minus or del plus del minus? No, no. It's del plus del minus. Let's, let's work that out. So wha what does it mean that we get del, uh, del plus del minus? So let's, uh, this is del minus of, as you say, x, x a, x mu, del minus of x nu, g mu nu. But this is the space-time metric. Now what is the space-time metric? Space-time metric was minus dt squared plus dx d minus 1 square. Okay, okay, yes, yes, I see. And here, uh, since we started this, let's also write this. So this is equal to minus dx plus dx minus. As you just do, a plus b into a minus b. Right? So this, okay. Um, and here we get plus del minus xi del minus x i is equal to zero. Do you see what this equation does? This equation completely solves for, this equation completely solves for x minus, or more precisely for del minus of x minus. If you know what the xi's are doing. Similarly, the constraint equation in the plus direction completely solves for del plus of x minus if you know what the xi's are doing. Is this clear? What this makes clear is that the final solution of our classical system 
is parameterized simply by what, what this makes clear is that the final solution of our, uh, of our, um, of our classical system is parameterized simply by what xi's are doing and perhaps some small zero mode information in the plus minus sector. We will come back to the zero mode in information very carefully as we move on. But at least as far as the oscillators are concerned, every oscillator piece here is completely solved for in terms of oscillators here. In, in terms of whatever the xi's are doing. Okay? So what is the final conclusion of our classical system? What's, fi what's our final conclusion in the solution of our classical problem? Okay. Our final conclusion is up to zero mode stuff, which we're going to come back to in just a minute. The classical system is completely parameterized by the harmonic oscillators, left and right moving harmonic oscillators of d minus two or d minus two quad. Okay? So instead of, uh, though we started with a system of d coordinates, what's left in inequivalent legal classical solutions are all the oscillator degrees of freedom of only d minus 2 quad. Now, before proceeding, let me quickly give you some physical intuition for this. Firstly, what do we have? We had a string. Okay? And the string was moving around. Okay? Now suppose you've got a string which you think of as like a rubber band in space. How many oscillator degrees of freedom does it have? Suppose you had a rubber band here. How many directions does it have to oscillate in? D minus 1 if D is this number of space dimension. Or D minus 2 if D is the number of space time dimension. Okay? Now, an actual string could might also have longitudinal. longitudinal vibrations. But those are completely fake in our string. You see, longitudinal vibrations would keep track of where a particle on the string is. But that, in our system, is taken, it's just a diffeomorphism. Moving the particles around on this uh, string without changing its world volume and space time was precisely what our diffeomorphisms were. And the diffeomorphisms were to be treated as gauge invariants. Okay? So those longitudinal excitations that might be there in a real rubber band string are not there in our system. The transverse excitations are there. That's why we have D minus 2 of them. No, no, but at the moment we haven't said anything about the string itself being the space coordinate. We're just looking at the motion of a string in space. So at the technical level, that is not what's going on. Maybe in some deep way, but at, th at this point, it's simpler. You see, the degrees of freedom of our string in our original number go to action was the world volume occupied by the string. What is a longitudinal excitation in terms of this world volume? Makes no sense. All I've told you is some surface that the string, hmm, there are no particles of the string to move around. That's the point. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're, you're, you're right. We we are assigning tension per unit physical length uh, of the string. Maybe that's another way of saying. It. But it, these particles were not even there. There was nothing to move around. The the degrees of freedom were parts of this world volume in space time. There was no substructure to this world volume. So there's no sense in which the longitudinal excitation could take place at all. Now, if I took the string and heated it up a bit if it was at finite temperature, then the stuff that's there at finite temperature can move like this. Okay? So if you do something, you make an excited version of the string and so on, and this would happen. That would be governed by like hydrodynamic excitations and so on. But in the, its vacuum, when, when all you have is this bare string moving, it doesn't have any subconstituents. This idea of longitudinal fl fluctuations is predicated on having subconstituents. The atom is moving around. And our string is not like that. It has no subconstituents. Okay, so it's a very element, it's a, yeah. Okay, ex excellent. So this is how, why we got D minus two 
uh, things. These are the d minus 2 transverse oscillations. And of course, we've got the d minus 2 uh, zero modes. Uh, we also have the zero modes from this sector. We'll deal with that very, very carefully as we go. I'll show you exactly in what sense we have those, those zero modes as we go. OK, any further questions or comments about this? That's the end of our classical analysis of the string. And now we're, we're going to become a quantum mechanic. Exactly. Exactly. Why is that the same as there is no constituent? Because you see, suppose I had a string and I had it was made up of atoms. Then what is this longitudinal fluctuation? It's moving this atom here. But you see that's a spatial diffeomorphism. So all these things have to be identified with each other. Is this clear? Okay? Excellent. Excellent. OK, now I want to proceed to do this analysis, not classically, but quantum mechanically. OK? This position has a x as a periodic input. Sorry, say again? X All x's are periodic input. So uh, is this explained through Yes. We're working so far with, with a string which was a loop like this. Yeah. OK? We will generalize, not, not too far <coughs> down the line, to open strings. OK, was this clear? Any questions or comments? Shall we move on? Good. So let's go. Now, now our next job is to make a quantum theory based on this. OK? And what we're going to do is to take this classical space of solutions of the string and find a symplectic form. OK? And then that symplectic form will allow us to find Poisson brackets. The Poisson brackets will be replaced by commutators, and then we'll be done. OK, so that's, a, that's, that's what we're, that's, that's our goal. Is yes? It that the can have yeah, I mean, it has excitations which can be localized, and those excitations can move. OK. It's very similar, like a D3 brain, since you're into this game. The D3 brain in the vacuum, you know, would not have this velocity degree of freedom that you see in hydrogen. Because that's a boost. And a boost leaves the vacuum unchanged. That's another way of saying this. Yeah. And OK, forget, there's lots to say about this. OK, uh, let's, let's keep going. So now, what I want to do now is to write down a symplectic form. Okay, what I want to do now is to write down a symplectic form on the classical phase space of our string. Now, how do we get such a symplectic form? Well, we just do canonical quantization. Okay, so let's start with here. We've got this action here. We've got this action here. What is the momentum conjugate to x mu in this action? So let's write out this 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 action uh, more. Well, okay. Let's. I'll write it down and then you see if you believe me. The momentum conjugate to x mu is minus p mu is equal to. Um, minus 1 by 2 pi alpha prime x mu dot. Maybe with a g mu dot, sorry. x mu dot where I've lowered with the metric in space time. OK? Why is that? Simply because, oh, uh, and I've got the minus sign wrong, plus. Why? Because this is just, uh, you know, minus dots x mu dot 
x mu dot plus x i dot x i dot. And I do the usual thing, I differentiate with respect, I take the Lagrangian and differentiate it with respect to x dot to get the con conjugate momentum. Okay, this is really the momentum density, right? P mu of sigma is this times the delta function. That's understood in my notation. Okay, you understand this, right? P mu, this is P mu of sigma, and this is x mu of sigma del delta of uh, uh, P mu of sigma, and there's some delta of what? Uh, ah, no, I mean just the functional moment, the momentum such that yeah, just it's this, so that the symplectic form of our theory. So, uh, are you guys familiar with the notion of a symplectic form? Okay, see. You know that in, in classical mechanics, you have this Poisson bracket, which is x Poisson bracket p, which is equal to 1. x a Poisson bracket p b is equal to delta a b. Hmm. More precisely, uh, more, more usefully, you can move to more general coordinates in phase space. So x a Poisson bracket uh, uh, p b is delta a b. Um, but P B Poisson bracket X A, okay, is equal to minus delta B A, okay. Using abstract coordinates in phase space, let's call these coordinates C A's, where C's could be either momenta or position. You get C A Poisson bracket C B equal to omega A B where omega a b is 1 if you have x and p of the same sort, minus 1 if you have p and x of the same sort, and 0 otherwise. Okay, so this omega is a matrix like this, 1, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, in the basis where we do x p, x p, x p. Okay. C is x1, p1, x2, p2, <coughs> x3, p3. So, so, so we've got, if you had n x's, you have two n x's and p's. Okay? So this is a nice way of writing what the symplectic structure is, uh, what, what, what the Poisson bracket structure is. Now, for many purposes, what's more useful than this omega is its inverse. So let me define omega a b to be the inverse of this omega. Just two cross two matrix, you can invert it. Okay? And one of the really nice things about this 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 inverse is that sorry, sorry. One of the really nice things about this this inverse is that with this inverse you can define the form omega. Is omega a b b x b x a b x so b c a b c b note that if this guy was one you know of this form omega here is minus of 0 1 minus 1 0 0 1 minus 1 0 and so on right because this kind of matrix times itself, that's what this minus is. Oh, Yeah, it's equal to minus of this. Okay? Now, you know the nice thing about this, this structure here is that it's a geometrical structure. By which I mean, now where I've got this form, I didn't, don't need to restrict, my, restrict myself to working with this original CA coordinates. I can do a coordinate change on that, and the form will remain unchanged. So you should, the way, the way uh, one thinks of classical mechanics slightly more sophisticatedly than Goldstein, 
is to think of classical mechanics as being, being living on a phase space. And on this phase space is defined a natural geometrical structure, which is this two form. Okay? This two form has two properties. Actually, here in this canonical coordinates, um, firstly, it's because it's a form because it's anti-symmetric. Secondly, in, in these canonical co coordinates, it's obvious that d omega is equal to 0. That the exterior derivative of this two form is 0. It's obvious because the components in this, these coordinates are constants. Okay. So now suppose I make a change of coordinates on C. I can make any change of coordinates I want. It could be linear, nonlinear, doesn't matter. I can coordinateize space space in any way I want. It will always be parametrized in any change of any any uh, any any coordinates by a form, a two form, which is always closed. Okay? So the symplectic form is a closed two form with some other properties. We won't get into all of that. We won't need that. Hey, we won't need the formal structure very much. Symplectic form on a manifold is a closed two form with some other properties. For instance, its rank has to be maximal and so on. We, we won't worry about all that, won't bother us. Okay? And uh, the symplectic form, um, the important thing here is that its symplectic form is a natural structure on phase space, which as I've tried to emphasize before, is the space of physical solutions, inequivalent classical solutions of a classical system. Is this statement clear? That phase space is the same as the space of classical solutions of a problem. Why is that? Well, ordinarily, when we think of x and p, that parametrizes phase space, but x and p should be thought of as parametrizing initial conditions, which parametrize solutions, which label solutions. So what the standard way of writing symplectic forms is in a particular parametrization of the space of solutions, namely parametrizing them by their initial x and their initial p. But you may find it more convenient to have another parametrization of solutions. If you find it more convenient to have that other parametrization of solutions in terms of some other coordinates, you can compute the symplectic form in those coordinates. You're free to do that. It's a geometrical structure. Any parametrization of phase space is as good. We're going to use that to save ourselves some algebra. Okay, this is utterly trivial what I'm going to do. You could do it in some standard way. It's like free field theory. But I'm going to do it fast using this, this idea. Okay? So now what I want to do is to, to evaluate the, the symplectic form. OK. Now, you see, what, what was in the standard thing, what was the symplectic form? It was the same as, can you see, minus dxi dpi. That minus is this minus here. xi Poisson bracket p was 1. When I did the inversion, I get the form in which x and p comes with a minus. Is this clear? OK. And maybe in the way I've written it, uh, I want a 2. Minus 2 x i d p i. Uh, because uh, you know the way I've, I've defined it, there are two ways of getting the same, ob the same object. We can have x and p and p and x. And then because omegas are minus, but the, the d's are mi minus of each other when you switch signs, so you get a factor of 2. OK. Is this clear? So if I know what my momentum is, I know, I know what my position is, all I have to do is to take d position times d momentum and sum over all uh, all, co uh, all coordinates. But here we just figured out what our momentum was. OK? And so our symplectic form is what? Our symplectic form omega, an abstract symplectic form, is equal to integral d sigma One by two pi alpha prime. Maybe in this way of writing it, there's a two. One by two pi alpha prime, and then, sorry. Ah, uh, 
minus um, x mu dot x mu dx mu wedge d x mu dot Because uh, we, we in, uh, in two forms, uh, it's usually one over n factorial uh, for n forms. Well, uh, let me just explain exactly what I mean. This here, mm. if I take this to be my definition, mm. then this will be omega xp dx dp mm. plus omega px uh, dp dx. Now, this is minus of dx dp, mm -hmm. and this is minus of dx. Right. So you got a two. Okay, the Poisson bracket just with x and p was one. So if you make a quadratic form out of Poisson brackets, you'll get a two. That's this two. Okay, we're going to invert that matrix. This is a matter of conventions. We just have to keep our head around us. You define it with a half, nobody will stop you. Okay, but let's say I made this convention, then th then this has this two. Okay, now what am I doing here? This is just this. You see, I've got one x and one p for every sigma. Right. Okay, this was the p, two pi alpha prime by d, uh, 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 d x mu. Okay, what? Wedge. Okay, I'm going to ask you to read about that. It's a yeah. It's it's um, how to make a two a two a two dimensional anti-symmetric object out of the product of two one. Just uh, anti-symmetric. Okay. okay. Suppose I have A alpha B alpha. Two objects with one index down. Wedge is A alpha B alpha uh, minus B alpha A alpha by two. Just anti-symmetric. Yeah. Wedge product. Everything is wedge product. Okay, if I write uh, two forms and I multiply them, wage is understood. Okay, all that I'm keeping track of here is that we're dealing with anti-symmetric matrices. Always, always, it's all wage. Forms are always multiplied with a wage. No, it's not. It's anti-symmetric. You see, if it was ds squared, this would be zero. <laughs> so, so omega a b is anti-symmetric. Where did the integral come from? It's because we have one position and one momentum in every sigma. We were supposed to sum over all A's, but we've got one for each sigma. So that's the integral. Is this clear? Label for classical coordinates and momentum. Is this clear? Uh, okay. So now we've got this nice symplectic form. What is the reason for working with these? Instead of doing something more standard and more simple, the reason is, uh, firstly, you should see this. But secondly, it saves us algebra. Because now what I'm going to do is to plug our classical solutions into the symplectic form and get the symplectic structure directly on our the labels of our classical solutions, namely our alpha mu's, alpha m mu's. So let's see that at work. Okay, what we had was xi. What we had was xi was equal to um, xi zero plus alpha prime p tau, pi tau, plus sum over m alpha i um, e to the power i alpha i n e to the power minus i n sigma plus plus alpha tilde i n e to the power minus i n sigma minus by n. X zero i, thank you. No dot, sorry? Yeah, x zero. Yeah. 
Okay. Now, what I do is I want the symplectic form on the labels of my classical solution. Let's look at the oscillator part first. What are the labels of the oscillator part of the classical solution? Alpha i n and alpha tilde i n. <coughs> I could have done this for all x mu. But at the moment, it's alpha i n, alpha, uh, alpha tilde i n. All I do is plug this into this expression. So I'm going to deal, deal with the oscillator parts and the zero mode parts separately. Okay. Clearly, the two do not mix. The transformed after we fixed gauge now. Now we fixed gauge. We're in this new coordinate, and I'm not going to write tilde because that's going to uh, complicate notation. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Very complicated, but we don't care. We move to this new coordinate. Hmm? Well now we fix gauge. It's like, you know, if you if you had light cone gauge, you had Lorentz gauge, one A is a complicated function of the other, but you don't care. You work in one gauge and you stick to that. Okay? So we're working in our light cone gauge. I'm working in the gauge in which x minus is you know what it was, just the zero mode part of x minus, no oscillator. Okay, now without doing any calculation, I want you to stare at this this formula and notice various things. Firstly, notice that if I plug one oscillator piece here, the only way I'm going to get something non-zero is I have to plug an oscillator piece here as well, because otherwise the integral over sigma will kill it. So only x i will survive. Uh, exactly. Okay. Next point is that while x plus had only zero mode parts, x minus had very complicated oscillator part. Right? That x minus oscillator part was very complicated functions of the oscillator parts of x i's. And that could have given rise to a very complicated symplectic form. But it vanishes. Because x zero, so a, x plus was is purely zero mode. This metric here has if you put an x plus here, you have to put an x minus here x zero uh, x plus was purely zero mode so anything that's oscillator from x minus vanishes by integral over sigma okay so if we're interested just in the oscillator part we'll come back to the zero mode right at the end if we're interested just in the oscillator part we get no contribution from the plus minus part of this you know only contribution comes from x size hmm. And the xi for the xi xi contribution, we just have to plug this in. So let's go ahead and plug it in. Okay. So we just plug it in. So we forget about the zero modes for now. We just plug in the oscillator. Okay. And uh, and move. Okay. So now what we want to do is to plug in that omega is equal to minus 2 integral d sigma by 2 pi alpha prime. i hits only i, so we can do it i by i. Okay, So let's drop the i index. Do one oscillator at a time. Right at the end, we'll put that in so to lighten the notation. Okay, So dx is what? That's d alpha n by n. Okay? So we get d alpha n by n times uh, times e to the power minus i n sigma plus plus d alpha tilde n by n times e to the power minus i n sigma minus times whatever we get with the dot okay so times whatever we get with the dot so we get d alpha till uh, alpha n by n and now we get a factor of 
minus i. So there's a minus here. Every time we'll get a minus i. So we get a 2i, let's say here. OK? Every time we get an n. OK? Um, and we should be a bit careful. This n is summed over. And this n is num another dummy variable. Let's call it, yeah, right, let's call it m. Hmm. There will be an overall factor of m here. I'll write the m right at the end. Uh, e to the power minus i uh, m sigma plus minus i plus d alpha m tilde by m e to the power minus i m sigma minus and then there is an the overall m. Well, but it doesn't matter because they are in a relative plus. So just break this up into four terms. So in each product, there are two dummy variables. Whether you want to call this dummy variable the same as this or that doesn't matter. It only matters if you multiply, not if it's an addition. So we is this clear? OK. So that is our symplectic form. Any Questions or comments? Now we just have to simplify this. What? Oh, oh, why, why, why no factor of 2? We had a factor of 2 here. But yeah. OK, excellent. But please keep checking my the algebra and the logic. That's very important. OK. So now we just have to simplify this, this, this object here. What? M is there overall, I'd say. D is it's with respect to the quad. You see, alphas are now coordinates on phase space. Okay. But they're defined in the phase Yes. So we've made, we've made a change of coordinates from x mu of sigma and p mu of sigma to alphas. Okay. So now we're going to get a symplectic form on the space labeled by, by alphas. What? Alpha n, yes. Now let's work it out. Now you see we have two kinds of terms. Alphas with alphas and alpha tildes with alpha tildes. Okay, let's, um, sorry, alphas with alphas and alpha tildes with alpha tildes, that's one kind. Yeah. And then there are the alpha with alpha tildes and alpha tildes with alpha, that's another kind. Let's work them out separately. Let's first start with the alphas with alphas. Now, as you commented, if we have alphas with alphas, the n here gives you the momentum in the sigma direction. Notice that the momentum in the sigma direction is opposite for alphas and alpha tildes. Because sigma plus and sigma minus have the same tau dependence, but opposite sigma. That's why we have to be careful. OK? So let's first do alphas with alphas. If we do alphas with alphas, clearly we only click when n is equal to minus n. Is this clear? Is this correct? Okay. So what do we get? Okay. So what do we get? We get omega is equal to uh, omega is equal to two i. Now we're doing this alpha. Yeah. So we get. Now this m 
has cancelled the same. Okay, the same out here was this. So this has gone. So we get 2i b alpha n wedge b alpha minus n. The integral is no longer there, right? Because it's already the integral. You're right, you're right, you're right. You're right. Uh, uh, and we get a factor of 2 pi from that integral over si uh, sigma, so by alpha prime. Yeah. 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 What? That would, I think, so much cancel out. Because of uh, m and n. Oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Everything cancels. Yeah. yeah. It will remain for the cross terms, but they will luckily be 0, as you would say. <laughs> OK. Uh, so d alpha n times d alpha minus n and divided by n. Now, notice that n here ran over all integers. Oh, all in, yes, all integers except 0, but positive and negative. Okay. So suppose we want to change this to something that runs only over positive integers. We have two types of terms, but it's very important that these two types of terms contribute equally. Why? Because suppose this was 5 and this was minus 5. Okay? There's another term where this is minus 5 and this is 5. When we switch the order, we get a minus sign. But, but because of the n, this was divided by 5, that was divided by minus 5. Okay? Just a factor of two. Okay, so this is equal to um, four i by alpha prime uh, sum over n is equal to one to infinity d alpha n wedge d alpha minus n by n. Clearly, whatever we got for alphas, we'll also get for alpha tildes. I'm not even writing it. Okay, obviously the same. Okay? Plus tilde. Okay? Now, on the other hand, suppose we uh, do the alphas and alpha tildes. What will we get? Yes. Exactly. We'll cancel out with each other. Let's let's see that algebra working in detail. We've got two kinds of terms. We've got this with this, and this, this, with, with, this. with this, and this with this. Okay. Let's see them working uh, nicely. So we get n with n. Right? OK. So we get, um, let's take the first term. So that's d alpha n wedge d alpha tilde n divided by n. OK? And we get a term which is d alpha tilde n wedge d alpha n also divided by n. But this just sums to 0. Because this is minus of this. OK? So it's just gone. So the cross terms just go away. And so the, uh, the symplectic form in this oscillator basis is extremely simple. Is this clear? OK. So wonderful. Now, these are the coordinates of the positive. What? These are apart from the zero modes, which we, which we have to still deal with. Uh, apart from the zero modes, uh, which we will deal with next, in the oscillator space, these are the coordinates on the whole system, and this is the symplectic form. Wonderful thing about these symplectic forms, it's flat. OK? So let's now, since we, it's a nice symplectic form, by inversion it can be converted into a Poisson bracket. Okay? 
So let's do that. Okay, now uh, yeah, let's do that. Uh, we just have to keep our wits about us with the minus sign. Okay, so let's see. So now this is two times two i by alpha prime b alpha n wedged b alpha minus n by n. So I want to claim that the symplectic form is going to be alpha n. Let's put that here and then sum over n. Clearly, it's n by n diagonal. We just take one, one n at a time. I want to claim that the symplectic form, that the Poisson bracket is going to be alpha n, alpha minus n is equal to minus alpha prime n by 2i. Why? Well, the 2 was just this overall dp dx dx dp. When you invert a matrix, you get, uh, when you invert an antisymmetric matrix, firstly, its elements get inverted. And you pick up a minus sign. So I've inverted the elements. Just minus. Hmm? Oh. Yeah. I, I, sh I wrote, uh, I didn't write a minus. I, I, I wanted. Uh, I said minus, but I didn't write it. Yes. Minus. I want to invert these elements. Alpha prime n by 2i. OK. And I want to pick up the minus sign, OK, which is equal to well, yeah. Now, uh, you're wondering why there's an I? Yeah, I mean, uh, well. Uh, that's going to go away soon because we're going to now turn this into a commutator. Yeah, I mean, in quantum there's usually an i, so that's in, in classic. So that's the well. Let me remind you that when uh, when we look at a harmonic oscillator, yeah, there's an i. Yeah. Is an a diagonal of no i in the quantum regime? I've chosen my coordinates so that they coordinates of a harmonic oscillator. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, but what I'm getting confused about is my minus signs. Have I got the minus correct? That is, of course, always the confusing thing here. Uh, so let me see. What is the rule? Um, what we're supposed to do to get the quantum commutator? Multiply by divide by i. Divide by i h plus. Right. Right. Divide by i h cross. That's that's yeah. good. That's good. I've got the i as the minus n correct. <laughs> okay. H cross is one. So we divide by i. Okay, so we get alpha n alpha minus n is equal to alpha prime n by 2. No, no, but, but uh, yeah. I, I, that, that's the question. What, what is the rule yeah, that x yeah, in classical is one. v was 1, and in, uh, the quantum, quantum was ih. So I h plus. Yeah, you're right. Is, uh, the commutator over ih. Commutator? Over ih goes to the Poisson bracket. Ah, 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 ah. But to get the commutator, I need to multiply by oh, ih. You're right. And he's right. So I've got a minus sign problem. Where have I messed up on my minus sign? So just, just a minute. Have I, uh, have I messed up in the following? Let me remember. Somewhere I messed up on a minus sign. It could be right at the beginning. Uh, let me remember. Uh, Uh, 
minus 2, but I replaced, I got rid of the minus with a minus i here. That made it the plus 2i. Uh, wait, just let me make sure I've done, where have I messed up my i? I, I, I hopefully we get this in a minute, just a minute. My, my minus i, just, just a minute. Uh, What? No, no. Yes. I had my minus two here. Right. But no, but I multiplied this by minus. Oh, oh, no, but th th that, this i, see there was a min an extra minus from this i. Yeah, go, go ahead. So instead of this plus, it's minus 2 times whatever the factor is. Yes. I thought I did that. You see, I took this two out. You want me to take minus, minus two out? But that's this. That was this minus thing. Don't say that. See, yeah. let, let me let me write this if you want as minus with a minus 2. That's what you wanted, right? Okay. So now after I've got this, whatever's here is to be identified with, with what appears in the Poisson bracket. Hmm. That's the minus I've ha I had. Uh, you have to invert this number. Yeah, that, that's my minus here. Uh, I, I just, 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 just give me one minute more. Uh, just give me one minute. I, it's a stupid minus sign. Uh, just, I, I just hope I got the original, uh, but my ends are what they should be. Um, uh, Does A go like e to the power minus i n t minus i omega t A or does it go like Where did I mess up with my eye? Uh, sorry, sorry, just give me one minute. Mm. I mean, I, I, I expect A with a. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I, I'm sorry, it's a very irritating minus sign. Just, just.
Okay. I, I, I'll fix this minus sign for you guys next time. I made a minus sign mistake. I can't see where it is at the moment. Okay. I'll fix the minus sign for you. I can't, can't, can't track it down now. It could be in my, it's somewhere, some, some, somewhere. I'm trying to find o omega AB upper. Upper, yeah, exactly. So this is 2i by alpha prime n without a penalty. See, omega AB upper has the same sign. If you write dx by dp with a minus sign, then that is the same sign as omega AB upper. Also can you say plus sign? Omega AB lower is different from omega AB upper. I'm No, no, that's not how it's written. No, no. This is the lower object, and the Poisson bracket has it with upper indices. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I messed up in some stupid way, uh, but it will take too long to track it down online. I think. Give me one minute. Uh, Okay, it's not worth it. Let me let me track down the sign. Uh, at home, I'll come and tell you to uh, next class what what my mistake was. Okay. 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 Um, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's very irritating, but okay. Um, okay. So now what we see is the following. Okay, now what we see is that we get this guy who's which has commutation relations uh, of this form. Now, um, uh, we we are usually it, it's nicer to deal with oscillators that are normalized so that they have commutation. Yeah, okay, what, what my algebra gave was a minus sign. I'm assuming I fixed it, and I get the plus sign. Okay, uh, it's. Nicer to deal with oscillators that are normalized such that this side is just n. Yeah. E, e dagger, I want one, right? Yeah. Anyway, so it's ni nice. So I'll redefine, I'm going to redefine my alpha n. Goes to the new alpha. So alpha n new is equal to alpha n, uh, or oh, let's say alpha n old is equal to alpha n mu times square root of alpha prime by 2. OK? So in terms of the, um, in terms of the new alpha prime, uh, alpha, alpha n's, we will have a square root of alpha prime by 2 outside here. And then alpha n, like uh, alpha n new. Okay, working with these new guys, I have ha almost standard harmonic oscillator commutation relations. Alpha n, alpha minus n uh, is equal to n. Okay, alpha n, alpha minus n is equal to n, where uh, a n is positive. I'll, I'll work it. I'll fix, fix the minus sign next. <laughs> okay. So alpha n, l, alpha minus n is equal to n. Now, the next thing that we 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 would want is the Hamiltonian for our system. Okay. 
Let me leave this as an exercise to you guys. Take the action that we had, okay, and compute the Hamiltonian. Once again, the just the oscillator part is that. Once again, the oscillator part will not receive any contribution from the plus minus sector because once again the cross terms just cancel out. So in the oscillator part, we're going to get something entirely from um, uh, entirely from the uh, um, uh, the alpha i's, and when you work it out, you will find that this is n. Classically, when you work it out, you'll find that this is n alpha i n alpha i minus n. Sum over n equals 1 to infinity and uh, sum i is equal to 1 to d minus 2. Okay, so what does this tell us? This relationship, together with this Hamiltonian, tells us that the i that the nth i oscillator, that the nth i oscillator, um, is a harmonic oscillator of energy n. Okay, oh sorry. You'll, you'll find this. I mean, you would have found this had been standard normalized. You'll find this. Sorry, just this. Just this. This was classical. If you would do it quantum mechanically, uh, uh, we'll get the two different orders and so on. We're going to come to that in a moment. But classically, you find what? Just harmonic oscillators. Okay, now I want you to see that this guy is a harmonic oscillator of energy n. Why is that? If I redefined this oscillator to give standard harmonic oscillator commutation relations, that would have been the redefinition alpha is equal to square root n times a. Alpha n was square root n times a and alpha minus n was square root n times a dagger. And then when you plug that into here, you've got two factors of square root n and so you've got a a dagger. There it is. Both orders will come, a dagger plus a dagger a. Okay, if you do it carefully quantum mechanically, just keeping both orders, you'll get the usual thing, right? By two. Okay, but classically, it's just it's that, that thing. Actually, this oscillator uh, normalization is generally one over square root n. So if if uh, if that is done, then probably yeah, if you if you if you absolutely, absolutely, uh, we're choosing a particular normalization. Uh, I want you to see that if this you have this Hamiltonian with this commutation relation, then those are, that the alpha i nth oscillators are oscillators of energy n. Is this clear? Okay. Now. Uh, the last thing, okay, um, uh, the, the, the last thing I want to say about this, we'll have to complete this next, next class, um, but the last thing I want to say about this uh, concerns the zero modes. Actually, maybe we should just postpone that to next class. Um, Okay, let me just say it in words and then we'll do it carefully next class. See, um, what we have here is uh, a bunch of oscillators, these 24 oscillators whose energy keeps increasing. In addition, we've got some zero modes, okay? And uh, uh, there will, however, be a, a, a relationship from the constraints that link what the zero modes are doing to what the oscillators are doing. Where does that come from? You see, we had this del alpha, uh, we had this del minus of x plus times del minus of x minus was equal to, uh, was equal to this, uh, uh, the stuff on the right hand side. Now, 
if we took the oscillator part of that equation, that allowed us to solve for the oscillator part of x minus yes. in terms of what xi's are doing. <laughs> that allowed us to just to throw away the oscillator part of x minus. Okay. However, what about the uh, uh, the zero mode part of that constraint? The zero mode part of that constraint. You see, all of x plus was zero mode by gate choice. So it would pick out only the zero mode part of x minus. Okay? Do you see that will give us p plus, p minus times some constant? Because del minus of x plus was proportional to p plus. Right? It was just a number. And then the zero mode of del minus of x minus is proportional to p minus. Do you see this? I'll say this in more detail next class. But you'll get number times p plus p minus. And then you'll get all the zero mode part of del, del minus of x plus, uh, xi del, del, mi, uh, del minus of xi. Now, the zero mode part of del minus of xi times del minus x, xi has two kinds of terms. The, 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 there's the zero mode of, of xi squared, which will basically be pi squared. And then there are the oscillator pieces. Because you can get contribution from two oscillators that combine together, that cancel together to give you a zero mode. So what this will give you, the p plus p minus will combine with the pi squared to give you a p squared. And then there'll be all the oscillator stuff. So what this will give you is an equation that will tell you that p squared is equal to some operator which will turn out to be this Hamiltonian. This Hamiltonian on the x size. Okay? So what this condition will give you is p squared is equal to number. Now this should remind you of what we did when we quantized the particle. You see, when we quantize the particle, what we got was p squared is equal to number. And when we finished the quantization of that part of it, we got a wave function, a sh an e a sh we sh the Schrodinger equation of that quantization was a Klein-Gordon equation of a particle of mass squared equal to that number. Okay? So what the end result of this quantization will be is that each oscillator state of these harmonic oscillators will correspond to a new particle. Each particle will have its own Schrodinger wave function. Each of these Schrodinger equations will obey the equation del squared plus m squared is equal to the on wave function is equal to zero. But the value of m squared will differ particle by particle. The value of m squared will be set by the eigenvalue of the sample. Okay? So the end result of this quantization will be that what we've produced from this quantization is, an e is a wave function for an infinite number of particles of ever increasing mass. One for each oscillator state of the d minus 2 oscillators okay, that you see in the x cycle. Okay, I will clear up the minus sign and explain this to you in more detail next Wednesday, where we will also also derive that this whole procedure only makes sense in 26 dimensions. Okay, we'll we'll see that. <laughs>